it's mitzvahs. Because Torah, on some level, is a chok. It's a statute. When we do something, even though we do not feel it, and we do not necessarily understand it, but we subjugate ourselves to it, there's an element of omel, of toil, and hard work. And if we do that, then Hashem promises us the whole world will be perfectly aligned for you. The blessings will pour down. I will give you your rain in its perfect time. The land will be fertile. Crops will be bountiful. Your animals will be so productive they will never miscarry. A tremendous amount of blessings. Your walk with me the Pasha ends. I will break the yoke of your servitude and you will walk with me, Komamias, upright. I think in some level that's the greatest blessing of all. Because in life, when we walk with a sense of personal meaning and fulfillment, and we're living for real, that's the greatest blessing. And then the Torah goes to the Torah. Pasuk after Pasuk describes a litany of curses and tragedies that will befall you in Telchu Imi Bekeri, if you walk with me casually. And the Torah goes to so many, much more than the Pesukim of the Bracha, I <coughs> didn't count them exactly, but they're probably around 12 Pesukim of Bracha, let's just see inside what we have here. There are the beginning of the Pasha. The psukim of the bracha are 11 psukim of blessing. And then we have from. Then we have thir, over, over 30 psukim of klala. And again and again, the Torah tells us oh, the land will stop giving its produce. And the Earth won't give forth its fruit. And in Telchu Imi Bikeri, if you go with me casually and you don't listen to me, you don't listen to me, I'm going to punish you seven times for your sins. I'm going to throw you out of the land and animals are going to attack you <coughs> because you went with me Bikeri with casualness. I think that's the, probably the best way to translate this. We'll discuss it in a moment. And because you're going with me casually, I'm going to go casually with you. And I'm going to smite you. And I'm going to, again and again, the Torah continues again, seven times for your sins. And there's going to be enemies that are going to invade you. And you're going to be completely destroyed and utterly annihilated. And if you still don't listen to me and you walk with me casually, again, I'm going to give you anger that is casual, that is with carry. Ooh. And I'm, you're going to eat the, your flesh of your children, and terrible problems are going to come to you. And the, the land will spit you out, and so on. And it gets continually worse. And continually, there is that all because this is going to be because you're walking with me, with Kerry, casually. But Af Asha Hochu, Imi, Bikeri. Af Ani, again, the Torah says, I will walk with you, Bikeri. Distant, rejecting, nonchalant. And then at the end of this terrible litany of, of curses, Hashem says, I'm going to remember ultimately the bris, the covenant that I had with your forefathers, and I remember that I took you out of the land of Egypt, and so on. Hopefully we'll have a little bit more of an in-depth discussion of the bracha, the words in the bracha, the klala, in the bracha itself. We don't find uh, the real blessing which is the blessing of the world to come. You don't really find it in the Torah anywhere, which is interesting, and it's a discussion for itself. There are allusions to it, and allusions to Tchiyas HaMesim. But why is there so little of the blessing and so much of the curse? <coughs> it's very fascinating. You know, the blessing, in a sense, is easy, it's understandable. We're born for a reason. We're born for a purpose. We're here in this world. We're created such an incredible creature. 
we had to serve him. He wouldn't create us without a blueprint, without a manual. He gave us the Torah. And yet there is tremendous resistance to our fulfilling his mitzvahs. And there is a blinding impulse and an incredible desire that pulls us away. <clears throat> and so the Torah has to warn us in the strongest form possible <clears throat> that it's toxic, skull and crossbones all over. Don't go there. Don't test me. Don't walk casually. Don't try and break and cast off the yoke of Torah and mitzvahs. such a fascinating world. There's a, there's a great maggot, you know, we could look at this from all different angles, but I'll tell you how the classic maggot of yesteryear, it's okay, the light is burning. Good, <laughs> see, it came right back on. Just don't panic. The classic maggot of yesteryear and how We'll see there are different approaches to dealing with the temptations and blandishments of the Eight Sahara and the challenge that we have to stay on the straight and narrow <coughs> and not be tempted to assert our independence and walk with God a little casually. Be a little free. Don't tell me what to do. How do we deal with it? I'll give you <coughs> the classic muscle. I mean, this idea or this theme is cloaked in a thousand different ways, but I'll tell it to you how the great Wojtyslava Magid said it over. Is a, in the olden days, in much of Eastern Europe, much of Ashkenaz, they had, you know, like you have, I don't know how to say a Magid, a Magid, probably in English you would call it a preacher, but it's really not a preacher in the Baptist sense where, you know, he would pour fire and brimstone and be this classic, uh, you know, you're going to burn in hell. A real maggot was able to cloak his message in a marshal that was captivating and mesmerizing so that it could be digested by the people to whom he was speaking. A maggot is like Haggadah. It flows. Good means to flow. In Hebrew, Kimo Vokdala, they flowed. There was a famous maggot, and he said a story <clears throat> in his city where he lived. There was a very exclusive jewelry store. Ayid, Mr. Samuels, ran the store. <clears throat> it wasn't Samuels' store, you know, he had stuff there commissioned by the finest jewelers. Probably had Tiffany watches, uh, Pate Philip watches with. Samuels on the front, <laughs> you know, I don't know, he was, he, was, he was up there, this was like one of the, the most exclusive jewelers in the city, if not the most exclusive, and uh, he had a nice livelihood. He was, a, you know, he was a little bit of a more modern type of fellow. But one day, he's sitting in his store, and uh, a very beautiful carriage rolls up in front of the store. Beautiful, two white horses. I mean, this is like, you know, a really fancy carriage. And a lady gets out of the carriage. She's dressed, beautiful clothes, hat, a fan. And she could see, you could see, you know, the servants waiting in the carriage on top, the driver's waiting on top for her. And she steps into the store <coughs> and she introduces herself. She was the wife of a very famous, world-famous psychologist, doctor, very innovative, who, who kind of got medals and his books were like, a, and he lived in the city, like in a very exclusive neighborhood in the city. She introduces herself as the wife of this famous doctor and she told the Mr. Sam, she said, you know, um, my, it's my birthday today and my husband, <coughs> it wasn't so well, he wanted to come with me, but he told me to come to the store and I can choose for myself three pieces of jewelry. I can choose whatever I want. And uh, the fellow is delighted. He's taking out the gorgeous, beautiful necklaces and diamond tennis bracelets. And then he took out a watch that studied with diamonds, a Cartier watch that was absolutely like, you know, one of a kind. 
and she's not sure she's looking at this she's looking at that she's thinking i'll take this piece perhaps i'll take that piece she says you know what let me take let's go if you can come with me back to my husband and i'll take with you know some of the nicest pieces she chose the nicest pieces in the store i mean we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars each piece was like the most best of its kind handcrafted in italy like beautiful pieces we'll go to my husband and we'll check it out she said, you know, Fellas is fine here, of course. He's delighted, like, wow, this is like the sale of the year. This is like incredible. <coughs> and they uh, wrap, she wraps, the, they put the pieces together in a, in, a, in, a, in a nice box and they step into the carriage. And uh, they go through the town. They come to the most exclusive boulevard in the, uh, in the town. And sure enough, <coughs> they roll up in front of a beautiful house and uh, the carriage waits in the driveway and she steps out she comes to the front door she welcomes him in and she says you know you wait here in the waiting room i'll just go into my husband and uh you know you'll come in in a moment let me show him the pieces and she takes the box he sees on the door you know dr professor Widdenkauer, that was his name whatever it says beautiful brass plate he's very excited he knows this very world famous doctor <laughs> you know he's going to make the sale of a lifetime and um, he's waiting there in the waiting room there in the salon. And um, he waits five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. She's not coming back. He starts getting a little anxious. <clears throat> he steps out of the room and he looks. He asks uh, one of the servants, Dr. Dr. Widdenkauer, his wife, uh, where is he? So the doctor, don't worry, he's just in the next room. Just go, go down the corridor right there. That's his, his uh, office. Goes and he knocks on the door, and the doctor's sitting there in his study, on his, in a chair, and there's a couch there in front of him, and he knocks in. He says, uh, "Doctor Widenkow." <coughs> he says, "Yeah." He says, <coughs> "You know, um, your wife picked up jewelry from the store. I'm just waiting to know." He says, "Oh, okay, sure. Just sit in the chair a little bit now. Uh, your, 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 your wife, my, my wife. You, you know, you." You're, you're, you're hallucinating, you're thinking, what, what's coming through your mind, that what, that, 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 and he treats him now like he's a patient, he's coming in, <laughs> he's, he's sitting there on the couch, and the doctor's looking at him and he's saying, I, I sympathize, one second, and he tries to reconstruct the whole story, I see what you're going through, you know, you, <laughs> he says, I'm not going through anything, your wife, he says, my wife died three years ago, I don't have a wife, what are you talking about? He realized he's been duped. He faints. And then the maggot got, you know, then he raises his voice. <laughs> he says, Rabbi Sai! <laughs> this is exactly what the Eight Sahara does. You know, he comes and he tempts us. And we think that this is going to be incredible. And he lures us into his space and all kinds of fantasies and glitter and glamour gleam before our eyes and before long we find ourselves <coughs> in a world of whether it's we're stealing whether it's impure acts or whether whatever it is but he sucks us in then he has us trapped and then we realize when we go upstairs the whole thing is just a facade it's a total it's an absolute trap and we're left bereft we're left with nothing it makes us bankrupt that's the eight sahara and many of the Bali Musa talk about the Melech Zokein Uksil. The Yetzirah is called, in the words of the sages, a Melech. He's a king because he rules over us. All our impulses, all our drives, all our mind is geared constantly to the allure and the temptation. What the great King Shlomo Melch says in Mishlein in Proverbs, Mayim gnuvim yumtaku, stolen waters are very sweet. And so sometimes there are things that we know our conscience may hurt us. They're over the fence, but it's so sweet we can't contain ourselves from sticking our finger in the honey bowl, in the honey bowl, in the honey jar, and then we realize, oh my gosh, I'm a mess. We have to clean up this mess. He's a king. He's an old king. In other words, he knows every trick in the book. But at the same time, he's a xil. He's a fool.
really what you mean he's a fool he's fooling us he's a jester it's really a pantomime it's really a fantasy that doesn't really afterwards it leaves us vapid empty and it only leaves us craving more because it's a trap as we acclimate ourselves to his to his nonsense we need more so we get trapped is a melzotnik so so many of the ballet musa and the great uh, those that are exhorting people whether it's to tshuva or to better our deeds focused on the on the yetsahara his tactics and how easily we can get trapped that was kind of the musa lithuanian world in the Hasidic world, they focused a little bit different. They focused on the light, a little bit of light pushes out a lot of darkness. Live in the light. Hashem loves us. And even if we slipped and even if we fell, we have to know that really the door is open. And sometimes even just the desire is so meaningful to Hashem. <coughs> <clears throat> and we have to realize that yes, there's the Yetzar, and yes, there is so much. But we can rise above that. My Rebbe used to say to me, the Nasim Shami used to say, it's like two people walking along the road and they face um, a big rock, a big mountain on the road. One guy takes out his hammer and he starts chipping away. He's going to break this rock. I'm going to knock it to pieces. I'm going to smatter it. The other guy says, let's rise over it. There's a famous saying. In, it's made into a song in Chabad. It's called L'Chatchila Ariba. In the Balatani, it's one of the most probably famous two words in Chabad. It's called L'Chatchila Ariba, which in Yiddish means um, let's step higher. And that's ideal. That's lachatchila. It's much better when we're able to lift ourselves up and see beyond, see the big picture, rather than fight the eight Sahara head on. I think in an ideal world, I think there's a, there is a combination of both. If we talk about it in, an, in a really personal or a psychological sense, we try and it's not realistic or ideal to be able to transport ourselves into a higher world and see the light, if you will, when we're battling the demons. At the same time, battling the demons is without desiring and yearning and wanting to connect to the light can be an exercise in futility. <laughs> After a while, we get willy-nilly, we get very weary. The body is a prison of sorts. It's pulling us down. There are all kinds of negative thoughts that creep into our mind. Strains of pessimism, despondency, sense of futility, helplessness kind of thoughts that say to us you know you can't you know good and the body is affected the thoughts <clears throat> create and affect our physiology our moods sometimes they rattle the walls of our prison and our body and the whole cage is shaking with anxiety and fear and a sense of uselessness now start reconstructing the body I'm gonna be strong I'm going to fight this Yetzirah. I'm not going to have these negative thoughts. But they keep fermenting because they are a byproduct of <laughs> the negativity that we are endowed with. I use the word endowed because it's all a blessing. All of life's challenges are a blessing. We're endowed with, whether it's upbringing, past experiences, whether it's behavioral conditioning, it's genetic, it doesn't make a difference. That's our cage. That's our body. It's a blessing. But we can't fight it. And then there's the light outside. 
just the light outside. If we read and you did Nefesh, I was just thinking, right as Shabbos was coming in, we were reading the Yedid Nefesh. It is the most powerful. It's written by the Bal HaCharedim. It is the most incredible. If you read Yedid Nefesh, those words, just, uh, you, you won't come, uh, well, yeah, no, this is Ashkenaz, um, so I'll have it in mirrors, I guess, in Charles Schubert. Uh, it's just such beautiful words. It. <laughs> we, we're asking Hashem. We want to. We want to run after Hashem. We want to be one like more with you. We want to be Meshuk Avtocha El Ritzinecha. Pull us to your will. We want to be connected to your will. We don't want to be fighting our will. We want to be one with you. The inner, the Yedid Nefesh. But just let's just just read the words and let's just translate it a little bit and see if we can connect to it because. Yedid Nefesh, the innermost, the Yedid Nefesh, the, the beloved, the closest. Yedid is from the word Yad Bayad, two hands coming together. You see it? Yad, Yad, Yedid. Yedid Nefesh, the inner yearning of my soul. The Yedid Nefesh, where am I locked into? It's Abba Rahman, it's you, Tati, you merciful one. <laughs> You're the one who's really, me and you, we're really locked together. We're inseparable. And all the challenges that I have is only because we're so close and therefore I feel so much guilt and pain when I wander off the reservation and I test the relationship. It's like with a parent where the relationship is so close, there's such a dependency. And because of that, there is such a fight for independence. We don't want to be dependent and we feel controlled but really I'm asserting that the essence of the relationship is Rav HaRachma and so help draw me to your will so that I can overcome all my instincts and impulses and negative thoughts this is what I desire that I should run after you like an ayol like a deer that runs to water so swiftly, so gracefully, without any impediments. Yishtachava, I want to bow down and surrender all my energies, el mulhadarecha, towards the glory of your grandeur, in your direction. Yerav lady desecha, please make it sweet to me. It's so hard when I dab and I feel so distant. When I put on tefillin, it's so mechanical. When I learn, it's like so dry. Yerav loy. The Harevna, make it sweet so that there's an Arevus, an Eruv is a connectivity, a bonding, there's an Eruv, we're one, it's a mixture. And then it's sweet. Yerv Secha, please make sweet that connectivity, but not simply sweet. Really sweet. That it should be so sweet that it's much sweeter than all the delicacies and fine goods that I desire. I love sweet chocolate, milk chocolate with topping and toffee on top with crystallized nuts. Minoifest suf, that's dripping honeycomb. I guess that was what the, the symbol of something that just, you know, they, they, in the olden days, it's going to be, make it much sweeter than anything in this material world that I yearn and crave for. It's, it over, it's so much more. The whole time, you know we're pulled in all these directions and we think that our body craves and our hormones get excited with all this stuff. This should be, I want this to be much, much more so that it's just nonsense. I'm not pulled in that direction anymore. It doesn't excite me. You excite me. How much majesty and how much beauty there is in the radiance of this world, your radiance that shines through. You know, as we talk about it, it evokes the feelings. Nafshi, 
Now my soul is sick for love of you. I want to be in love with you. Hello. <laughs> this is a real love poem. Anna, please. You know, Miriam, <clears throat> when she had Saras, <clears throat> she spoke ill of her brother Moshe. And immediately and instinctively, she was on such a high level, leprosy broke out on her. And Moshe prayed on her behalf. He said, Anna, what did he say? Kel na rafa na la. Please, Hashem, heal her. And so we are saying the same words to Hashem. Anna, please, yes. That sounds like hala. You say that in hala? 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 Anna, yes. In, Anna. in hala. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That's what we say in hala. It's the strongest expression of the ani and the na. My whole being is enveloped. It's an acronym of Ani and Na. My whole eye, Ani Vahoi Hashia Na. My whole eye is invested in this Bakasha, in this request. Anna, oh, no, please. Kelna, Rufanala, heal me. Do you know how you're going to heal me? By showing the light. By showing my Neshama, by igniting my Neshama with Noam Zibecha, with the sweetness of your shine. Oz then, Tishazik. I'll become strong for Tisrape and I'll be healed for Hoysala and there will be to my inner being Simchas Olam, eternal joy. You have to, we have to kind of tune into this because this, this is not normal talk, you know. <laughs> we, we become so sterile because we're Ashkenazite for centuries and um, <clears throat> we lived in a survivalistic mentality, in a Christian superstitious. In the Sephardi world, there was much more of a sense of, you know, maybe their conditions were different, the mind was different. David Amelach, you read Tehillim, it's all an outpouring of the heart and the emotions to Hashem. Every mood he expresses, and he says, Hashem, help me through this. I want to be close to you. I'm yearning. It's real. We sing it. <laughs> doesn't do it. It's okay. <laughs> Better than nothing. Classic. <laughs> means the one who is attic, the one who's since time immemorial. I think he translates it here, all worthy one. Yehemenorach Mecha, let your mercy be aroused towards me. Forgive me, look goodly at me. Let me find grace in your eyes. Chusana. Have mercy, our Ben Avecha, on the son of the one that loved you. <coughs> our forefathers loved you. Our ancestors loved you. They sacrificed so much for you. Look at me favorably. Because this, for so long, I desire to desire. It's true, maybe I'm not enveloped with this desire. But my true desire, my inner desire, is to desire. Leroy Smeher Bisferiskasacha. Every word is incredible. Higala na of Reschafilala. Reveal yourself to me. Show me your love. And envelop me with Sukhas Shlemecha. Toy Eres Mikvidecha. It's not just about me. I want the whole world to shine forth with your presence. Nagila Venis Mechavach, that we should rejoice with you. The time has come, please. Open up the heavens. Let us find favor in your eyes like the early days in the time of the base of Mikdash. Where we were on fire. And we felt the fire and saw the fire. Now, <clears throat> that is a lot better than fighting the Eight Sahara head on. The Gemara tells us that if the Yetzirah gets hold of a person, 
and they're tossing and turning in bed and they're going crazy. What do they do? So the Gemara says, first you should do, this is what the Gemara tells us, Yasit Torah. Throw yourself in Torah. And then the Torah is going to put your mind in a world of light, of God's wisdom, of knowledge. Then the Gemara says, recognizing that doesn't always work. You can't switch on the light. You sit there in the Gemara and it's like a haze and a daze and a glaze and just the, 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 you're just going crazy. You just, it, it doesn't work. You can't, you can't even focus. So the Gemara says, what should you do second best? Read the Shema. Yikra Kriya Shema. Shema Yisrael. Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. You're the source of everything. You gave me these impulses and these desires. I love you. Vahavtes Hashem Elokeinu then the Gemara says, well, what happens if that doesn't work? I can't even concentrate on the words. It's not going. The Gemara says, yes, misa. Then remind yourself of the day of death. A person should envision, this is really t tried, tested, and proven. A person just can't arrest the mind that is racing and the negativity that's pulling them in the wrong direction. And they're about to do something they know, but this is terrible. Go into a freezing cold shower. Switch on the water. <laughs> it works. Go, you know what you can do? The Gemara says, just imagine yourself being taken in the box and everybody walking, you hear the pit pat of everybody's feet. Shlomo Melch describes this in Kehelis so perfectly. The day of death, with all the people accompanying the beer. And then we come to the gravesite, <clears throat> and there they are on the edge. Some crying, some people asking for mechila, but here I am in the box, a lifeless clod, a massive body, and they're just lowering the box down into the ground. It's dark down there. It's gonna be forever lonely. And then you're lying in the box, and you hear the clods of earth banging on the pine box lid wrapped there inside in a talus and the earth is banging on the box and it's closing in on the box six feet under the ground and then it's raining on top and they're just throwing the earth more and more and more. And then they leave. Just left in that box. Ooh, that's a good wake-up call. <laughs> that kind of puts it into perspective. But if that's so effective, why did Bali Musa say, the Sforum say, why doesn't the God say, why didn't the Gemara say, do it first? You're rolling downhill. Pull the parking brake! Think of the day of death! And then says, you don't want to go there. That's the last resort. We want to live in a positive zone. We need everything. We've got to have everything in our arsenal. It's true. We've got to realize the Sahara is after us and it's duping us and it's making us look like a fool. And this is crazy and it's toxic and we'll regret this for the rest of our life. And we've got to fight that Yate Sahara. I'm in the battle. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to straighten this out. <sighs> but we've got to switch on the light. In truth, we need a combination of both. But the primary force that we seek and we want is to live in a zone of positivity. Because a little bit of light pushes out a lot of darkness. Hashem, I want to be close to you. It's all you. Help me. Give me the strength. Here I really yearn and desire. I want to be one with you. Hashem, help me. Draw me over to Necha so that I should feel your will. I feel so closed. I feel so distant. I feel so dry. But I want to feel you. That's an ideal.
our relationship with Hashem mirrors His relationship with us. We walk with Him casually, kind of trying to shake Him off. Don't tell me what to do. I don't want to live with all this religious, rigid rules and rituals. And I got to live like this and like that and keep the mitzvahs and keep the Shabbos. I want to be free. In Yiddish, it's called fry. Fry. I want to be fry. <laughs> you heard the expression fry. Fry means not religious. It means free. I want to be free. Hashem says, you know what? You're free with me. I'm free with you. And it's so painful. It's so painful. Deep down, it's so painful because we want to be close. We want to be one. We want to be together. We want to love and be loved. We want to be close to our source. That rattles the body. That makes us feel riddled with Jewish guilt because we have a big soul. It's not what we really want. It's not what we really want. So we're switching on the light and we're fighting the negativity. And in Mitzvah Hashem, if we really desire B'derech she'odam rotze leilech in the pathway that a man wants to go ba milichim oisoi. That's the way he will ultimately arrive. We're in it for real. You're in the army now! Do you remember that? What was it from? Some early movie from the 50s or something? <coughs> it's a song of... Huh? I know the song of... The song of the... You're in the army now? Yeah, I don't know what I used to say when I was a kid. <laughs> well, we're all in the Sivas Hashem, and we're happy whether we are in as a rank of private, whether we're a captain, a major, general, wherever you put me, Hashem, I'm yours. Have a wonderful week. Good Shabbos, everybody. Shabbos. 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 Shabbos.